Welcome back to the program. Of course, this is Bottom Line Africa, right here on KTN News. And as, as I've earlier promised you, I spoke to Unit Chair, Special Envoy in Somalia, Ambassador Mohamed Afe on the refugee status. Here's that conversation. Take a look. Good evening, Ambassador Afe, and welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Now, the world is marking the World Refugee Day today, and naturally, there's no way we can avoid to talk about the Dadaab refugee camp, which was once the largest refugee camp uh, in the world. I understand it's not anymore. So can you perhaps start by telling us what is the status of the Dadaab refugee camp? First of all, before I speak on to Dadaab, it's important for the world to reflect on this day. This is an important day that all of us must reflect on and see what we can do to ease the lives of refugees. People who flee their countries, seeking for safety and protection in another territory. Communities and families who get displaced, traumatized, seeking for comfort in a country that they think is more peaceful than where they left. A day like this, I think, is an important day for all of us to reflect on also the root causes of why people continue to flee their homes. We have situations that are currently ongoing in South Sudan. We have a situation in Yemen. We have a situation in Syria. We have the Rohingyas, uh, refugees. So globally, I think there is need to reflect global leaders, countries that host, on how to make lives easy, less painful for those who are fleeing. And therefore, I think a day like World Refugee Day it's a day of reflection, of deep reflection. It's a day of compassion. It's a day, I think, we as UNHCR and the international community will continue to thank all those countries who have been generous enough to open their, their borders for those who are fleeing uh, their countries for safety and for protection. And uh, with regards to the repatriation process, can you perhaps tell us who is facilitating this process? And at the same time, how does the numbers look like at the moment? Are people willing to go back to Somalia, perhaps? Now, in, in, in the context of Kenya and in the context of Dadaab, Dadaab, as you correctly observed, was one of the world's largest refugee complex. Now it is not. I think there are countries we have overtaken. The reason is because 27 years after the situation in Somalia, quite a number, a substantial number of Somalis have chosen to go back voluntarily. So since the last three years, we, we had over 80,000, almost 80,000 Somalis who voluntarily have gone back. Some have left the camps. Uh, some have gone back into Somalia, about 80,000 as we speak. and. Uh, it's important to, to realize that a company like the Dabna, which, which has about 250,000 still uh, refugees, uh, requires still attention. It requires uh, to be supported. We all need to rally around the government of Kenya to support uh, the programs on how they can make it better for people in the Dab, in Kakuma. At least those are the major camps that we know. And for many others, not only Somalis, but from other countries that come to seek for refuge here. So the agreement that Kenya government and UNHCR and the Somali federal government had was to allow for smooth voluntary return for those who make the choice to return, but also to allow for those who wish to stay, to stay in safety and in dignity, to continue to enjoy the hospitality of the Kenyan people and the Kenyan government. Nobody wants to be a refugee all of his life. So there, there are mainly three durable solutions that we continue to pursue. One, of course, is voluntary return in safety and dignity, which quite a number have chosen to do. The other is resettlement spaces for countries that are big economies, for countries that have been generous enough, for donors, to resettle the most vulnerable. And this, I think, we have uh, had a serious setback the last many months because the countries that have been generous enough begin to review their, 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 that generosity in terms of reducing the number. And this, I think, is something that we as UNHCR have been concerned about and want to plead with those countries that have been very kind and generous to continue to, to receive and to resettle as a solution, as a durable solution. The third one, of course, is the whole aspect of local integration. Now, Kenya government and the government in this region have been kind enough to, to meet in Nairobi in March 20, 2017 under the auspices of IGAD. 
Here they agreed to allow to protect for those who wish to protection. So the, for the Somalis who don't want to go back, they will still remain in Kenya and the Kenya government will protect them until such a time that they would like to go back. But we are asking for the countries to do even more to put this refugee population in their national plans, to include them in their national activities, and for the financial commitment to be supported by the international community. Because Kenya government alone cannot carry the burden of, of, inclusive, of providing the resources to include. So we are asking within, within the framework of the comprehensive uh, framework, the new framework, comprehensive refugee response framework, CRRF, for countries that are the donors to support Kenya government and other countries in the region with resources. Because I think if these countries get resources, they can be able to cope up with the demand that is brought about by, by more inclusion. Mm -hmm. So we do not want to wish to see people living as refugees forever. We are now talking about third generation, fourth generation Somali refugees, South Sudanese refugees in the camps. Mm -hmm. Their parents came here. They are the ones who become parents. Now they are becoming grandparents and yet they still feel to feel that they need to stay here. So I think we need to, to readjust our thoughts, to readjust our strategies. The countries in the region, we are pleading with them. And I'm, I'm glad that some countries are already beginning to respond, Uganda, uh, Djibouti, by removing the whole issue of encampment. Because I think when you allow people to have free movement, you have you give them education, they allow to do trade and business, they become productive in the countries they stay in, particularly in Kenya and Ethiopia and Djibouti. They contribute to the economy in a, in a more constructive manner. I think by the end of it all, they become useful citizens, uh, useful members of the, of, 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 of the country that has hosted them. And we are pleading ourselves for countries to continue to redefine. So I'm glad that the president of Kenya, in fact, hosted a, a regional summit to find a durable solution here in Nairobi. And that summit is what we have now, a roadmap that we are beginning to see whether the region can be able to implement. Mm -hmm. Still about the Dab refugee camp. I remember some time back when, you know, the Kenyan government on numerous occasions really wanted to shut the camp down and they've cited one of their major reasons being, you know, insecurity. So this time around they've remained a bit silent about this whole issue. Uh, can you perhaps tell us... Uh, what is being done at the Dadaab refugee camp? How the security situation there are contained? Well, first of all, I think personally that uh, uh, that we have no evidence that the refugees were involved in in s threatening security of the country. Not only here, because the Somalis are not only hosted in Kenya; they are hosted in in Uganda, they are hosted in Ethiopia, they are hosted in Djibouti, in Yemen, and all over these places. So. But we had a discussion, of course, the productive discussion with the Kenya government. Kenya government is very much involved in providing security to its nationals as well as the refugees. We, we are now glad that at least we don't have incidents uh, that, that we were used to a while ago, uh, which the Kenya government should be credited for, because this is a country whose government is a lot, the security forces are a lot, and therefore I think we need just to encourage the government of Kenya, and we need to support uh, with the resources required in order to confront any possible security threat. Because a security threat is not only a threat to refugees, but also a threat to, to the nationals of this country. Secondly, I think that we need to put a lot of effort in Somalia in order to create positive conditions in the country to allow the, member, the citizens of that country to return back. They have told me in all my regional tours, I've visited all the camps all the countries that are hosting Somali refugees. They're telling me they don't want to become refugees forever. They are yearning for the day to go back. But the challenges in the country is such that it is not ready now to receive massive return. I mean, we're talking about almost 2.5 Somalis internally displaced, 1 million externally uh, within the neighbors of Somalia, and who will want to go back one day and make their country better. So I think all of us need to put effort in Somalia, create conditions in infrastructure, in roads, in health, in education, in livelihoods, so that people can go back to a dignified setting and then they can make their lives better. In the meantime, before that situation is ready, we are pleading with the countries that have continued to host like Kenya, 
to continue the hospitality they are used to, they are, they are known for, to continue to host the refugees, not only Somalis, but those ones who flee their country seeking for safety, so that they can be able to improve their lives and make themselves better, not only when they're here, but when they return. So generally, I think there is a feeling that people will return back when the conditions are right. And some are making the courageous choice to go back. We encourage those who go back to go back and support it. We support them to go back as they make the decision to go. But for those who remain, the challenges continue to remain with us and the Kenya government and the partners who continue to support them in the country that hosts them. So, Ambassador Afe, some time back when we had a similar conversation, I believe it was back in 2017, you had the view that the international community have forgotten uh, the refugees, especially the Somali refugees in the Dab and other parts of East Africa. So do you hold the same view? Are you getting the necessary support from the international community? First of all, my appointment has confirmed the fact that there is need to, pro to, to bring back attention to the Somali refugees. This is one of the most protracted refugee crises we have globally. We are talking about 25, 26 years of a refugee population, of a population still as refugees outside. So I think and the world has moved on. The, the media moves with the current crisis. Uh, and the current crisis are the crisis of South Sudan, the, the crisis of Yemen, the crisis of Syria. And therefore, I think that I have had a feeling myself, and I still do, that we require to have more focus on the welfare, on the protection, on support for refugees like the ones of, from Somalia, who globally we continue to support. But I think because of the media attention, the focus has shifted. So the needs are still there. The needs that these people had 27 years that they left Somalia are still apparent in the country that hosts them. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, we require more spotlight to be given to the Somalia refugee station. The High Commission has appointed me to do advocacy work, and I continue to do advocacy work for Somali refugees globally. I was in South Africa. I am going to, to Yemen. I was in Somalia, I was in Uganda, I, I have been visited Kenya many times. So I think there is need to provide the global attention back so that the resources required to support them are mobilized because we realize that because of the focus has moved elsewhere, we have dwindling resources to the camps, to the, to the partners that we work with. And those dwindling resources affect all the sectors of the needs the Somali refugees have. They have needs for education, they have needs for health care, they have needs for nutrition, they have needs for shelter, they have needs for livelihoods. All these things are affected because precisely of the fact that the, the global attention has substantially moved to crisis producing countries, yes. currently producing refugees. Yes. Now, uh, you've already talked about the need for the international community to pay focus or pay attention on the Somali refugees. Uh, can you perhaps tell us about this? Because there are those who come from the school of thought that, you know, African uh, problems should be tackled by African solutions. So apart from the international community, what are African countries doing about their own refugees in this continent? And are bodies like IGAD, perhaps the African Union, doing anything about this? I agree with you that Africa solutions, Africa problems for Africa solutions. And I'm glad that, first of all, African countries are the greatest producers of refugees, but also they are the greatest host countries. Nearly 90% of African refugee population are hosted within Africa. And, uh, and African countries begin to provide even support to deal with the root cause. In the context of Kenya and uh, IGAD, uh, they have dealt, uh, they continue to deal with the situation of Somalia. In the, the, the context of Kenya and IGAD, again, they continue to deal with the question of South Sudan. So I think that Africa needs to, to, to do even more by dealing with these root causes, because people don't become refugees by choice. It's mostly as a result of bad politics, insecurity brought by, by poor governance. And therefore, I think we need to sort out within Africa, those issues so that we don't produce more refugees. Mm -hmm. However, I think globally there's a responsibility, internationally, that demand that we support the countries that host these refugees, that the countries that host these refugees not only require resources, but they also require 
support in terms of stability. And therefore, I think internationally we need to, to big countries, the big economies need to play a more active role in dealing with this situation. Because if you become a refugee in Kenya, you can end up becoming, you, you find yourself in Italy or in Europe. And we have, said, we have seen young people making dangerous migration for us into the seas. Some of them die in the seas, some of them manage, but also become a challenge uh, to, to the countries that they go to. So I think in order to, to stop this migration, we need to, follow, to deal with the situation at home. And even if we cannot deal at home, near home, in the countries that host them. So African countries, I think, need to provide uh, more for the countries, for the countries that have problems, for hosting more refugees, and for providing solutions to deal with the root causes of the problems that these refugees flee from in the first place. Ambassador Afe, you've already said that the repatriation process is voluntary, but it seems there's some refugees who don't want or they're not willing to go back uh, to Somalia at the moment. Can you perhaps tell us how the situation is like in Somalia and perhaps what are some of the reasons that these refugees have cited that, you know, makes them not to uh, go back to their, to their mother country? Let me tell you, refugees are a global asset. Refugees are the assets. Refugees are as you and me and anybody else can be a refugee tomorrow. So you never know who is going to be a refugee. So I don't think that is something that we should, we, we should, we should, we should criminalize those people who are victims of war. I think they are human beings that have got all the energies and the intelligence to, to grow. We have seen in Kenya, for instance, in the camps, in Kakuma, for instance, international financial institutions have, pro have shown that Kakuma refugee camps contribute a lot to the economy of Kakuma and to the economy of Kenya. The same case we have also established that the refugee camps in Dadaab contribute to the economy of the people in Dadaab and also to the economy of the country, even basically by the, by the remittances that they get from relatives outside alone. Not only the amount of money spent by partners inside the camps, millions of dollars of money is spent in these countries. So first of all, I think they are, a, they are an asset. They are not a burden. Secondly, we have seen some of who have been resettled. We have now the Minister of Immigration in Canada who is a refugee himself. Today he is Canadian Minister for Immigration. He came through Kenya. We have uh, the, model, uh, the model Halima Adan who was born in Kakuma. Today she is a global refugee model. She's a, she's a citizen of America, but she is a model. She has contributed to the economy of America. Many, many refugees have done that. We have got Ilhan Omar who is now running for the Congress in the U.S from Dadaab to a congresswoman, hopefully very soon. So I think that if we assess the contribution of refugees globally, it's massive. The countries they have gone to, they have contributed their economy, their politics, their social stability. The countries that they are hosting them have substantially benefited. All what we need to do, I think, is to ease the regulations for them. I think we should not treat them as second-class citizens. I think we should give them more inclusion in the national programs, in the national activities. And the countries that have continued to resettle refugees, I want them and I want to encourage them to even do more. Because resettlement possibilities have shrunk over the last many years. And uh, countries like the United States, which was the lead country in the resettlement of refugees, begin to downscale. I think it's not a good, uh, good decision. It's not, a, it's not a decision that's wise. It requires to be revised. So those very vulnerable groups who can be able to be resettled, great majority want to go back home. So we have to also to fix the countries of origin by politically stabilizing them, by building the economies of those countries so they can return back. But in the meantime, we need to help those countries that have been generous enough to host refugees to be supported and for the countries to redefine their laws. Because I think that a country like Kenya stands a lot to benefit from hosting refugees. Only if we can redefine a little bit of the laws we have by allowing free movement of the refugees to go and do trade, to go and do business, by allowing livelihood activities to happen in the camps and to remove the whole issue of encampment. I think personally, especially in with the High Commissioner, I want to plead with the countries like Kenya and Ethiopia to revise the whole concept of camps. A camp is a big prison area. It's an open prison. You cannot, you're not allowed to move out of a, of a territory. But these are human beings who have desires, who have passion, who want to grow. And the only way to grow is to move. 
to do trade, and, and I think it's the right thing to do. And I hope that the international community can support countries like Kenya, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Uganda, uh, in trying to cope up with the challenges brought about. Because the facilities that the refugees use, the host communities also use. So there's a strain on the facilities. So those facilities need to be supported. Schools need to be built. Boreholes need to be constructed. The environment needs to be rehabilitated. Because I think that a lot of damage is, is received by the environment by hosting large numbers of people in one particular area. Therefore, I think we need to help countries that host this population to deal with environmental challenges. Because they come as a result of, of human beings settling in one place. Yes. And, and I think African leaders need to know, and as an African myself, <clears throat> we need to know that we, we need to treat our people well. We need to run our countries well. We should not allow our people to flee, because these are assets of countries. We should not allow our people to flee for safety. Safety is the first responsibility of governments. Therefore, poor governance, corruption, uh, 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 political instability, all these things, I think, can be fixed by the leaders in these countries. We have got a large number of Burundi refugees in Tanzania. We have got a large number of Burundi refugees in Uganda. They don't have to be there. These are people who, who have a country, and they don't want to be refugees, but they have been compelled to be. I think we need to fix uh, South Sudan. The South Sudan leadership needs to up its game. We cannot allow a young country like South Sudan to continue to produce refugees. These people who are in, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in, Jibu, in, uh, in Uganda, these South Sudanese, they have homes. They would like to go back. But they are not going back because they feel and safe, they feel insecure. We need to deal with the root cause of these problems. And I think the responsibility lies with the political leaders in those countries, and together with the neighboring countries, together with the international community, to fix the politics. Bad politics is the reason number one for people to flee. And therefore, I think it's the responsibility for those countries. We have a similar situation in Mali, you know, in the Sahel region. We have a situation in Libya, where Libyans have refugees also in the neighboring countries. So therefore, I think, we, we need to fix the politics. The countries need to be stable. And the responsibility, number one, lies with the leaders of those countries. I think that for those countries who continue to produce refugees, I must say their leaders have failed them. There's no possibility of somebody leaving his country if he knows that there's comfort to live in his country. People live for a reason. They don't, become, they don't live because they would like to become a tourist in other countries, in other people's homes. They are living because of circumstances. They have been pushed out by civil war, by instability, by, by bad governance. I think that's what we need to fix. And I'm glad that countries like Kenya continue to show the way. Uh, the political stability in this country has made it possible for many people from many parts of the world to come and seek for refuge. I would like to encourage the Kenya government and the Kenyan leaders to make sure that this country is stable. If this country is not stable, it does not only affect Kenya, but it affects Africa. First of all, Somalia is making a lot of progress, thanks to the Somali leadership, to the Somali people. I think we need to appreciate the resilience of the Somali people. This is a country that has seen pain and destruction for 27 years, civil war that has destroyed almost all the institutions of the country. And the country continues to make progress. So peace is coming back slowly. Pockets of the country is safe, as you know. Uh, certain parts of the country is still not safe, particularly in the rural areas, is in the hands of uh, criminal elements. And the country's governance has not reached, either at the regional level or at the national level, it has not reached the entire spectrum of the geography of the country. So security is a big challenge in the country. That's why many people who want to go back home feel that in part of the country where still the government has not reached. They cannot be able to go back. Therefore, that's some of the reasons why they don't want to go back is because the country is not fully pacified. They would like to go back to their farms, to their villages, but still their villages is not in the hands of government. So this is one particular challenge. The other challenge is that of education, because the infrastructure has been destroyed. Uh, schools, universities in pockets of the country is OK, but many parts of the country still very basic. And therefore, I think people want to have their children have education. So those who are resisting to go back, some of the reasons they give is because they think that the areas they have initially fled is not yet 
properly secured to provide the education of their children. Of course, the other one is the whole general issue of livelihoods. So I think that what I advocate for myself is investments in Somalia, for the international financial institutions to begin to invest in Somalia in a robust way, in a meaningful way, so the country can grow. Because if the country grows, if the economy grows, people will go back. They will find jobs. They will find business. They will find safety. So I think that even as the neighbor, country's neighboring, neighboring Somalia support the pacifications of Somalia, the international community needs to support the Somali government because this is a government that's now doing substantial efforts. As we see it, it has the legitimacy of the people. The people in Somalia believe this is their government. They continue to support on a daily basis. I think all what we need is to support the government programs, and eventually Somalia will turn the corner and become a stable country and receive. Somalia used to receive refugees from the neighboring countries. Now Somalis are refugees in the neighboring countries. So, you know, the same can happen in any country. And therefore, I'm glad that the, the international community, the Somali people, the countries neighboring Somalia, are beginning to realize that stability of Somalia is of global interest. Stability of Somalia is not only for Somalis, it's for Kenya, it's for Ethiopia, for Djibouti. So I think it's an effort. The world has become a global village that this effort requires to be redoubled. And I'm glad that the international community has focused now. The neighboring countries have focused. The Somali government have focused. I think very soon the Somalis who are in the camps will go back home and Somalia will become a country that the Somalis are proud of and at peace with itself and with its neighbors. We're all looking forward to that day. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Okay. Shukran. Thanks eh? for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Shukran. Now, over to our images of the day, and they come from today's World Refugee Day uh, commemoration. The United Nations indicates that there are over 68.5 million people displaced worldwide. East Africa has 2.2 million refugees, with Kenya hosting nearly half a million refugees, mainly from Somalia and South Sudan. Well, and that brings us to the end of our program tonight. Many thanks for watching. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim. Have a very good night. Bye-bye for now.